Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Playful Humans podcast. I'm your host, Mike Montague, and my guest this week is a very interesting and playful human, scientific researcher, podcaster, writer, funk bass player, and his name's Jeremy Sherman. He's been sitting right here the whole time. Uh, he is an all-around playful human, and we're going to talk to him about what it's like to play for a living. If you uh, would like to learn more about Playful Humans, I suggest you join our club at PlayfulHumans.com. There's even a quiz on the website there if you would like to find out what your playful personality is. Give that a try. And then if you want to find Jeremy, go to JeremySherman.com. with the joke of the week here on the podcast so the joke of the week is brought to you by snoring snoring it annoys the your spouse at night and scares the hell out of everyone in your car when you're driving try snoring today uh now my joke of the week is why do cows wear bells why because their horns don't work (laughs) all right do you have one for us i have i have two because they're short uh what do you get when you cross an elephant with a rhino? Elephino. Elephino. <laughs> and and the other one I got from a kindergarten teacher uh, who I think got it from one of the kids, which is, uh, what did the zero say to the eight? Nice belt. <laughs> <laughs> nice belt. Uh, that one's an old one. I've definitely heard that one before. I, but but I you love probably went to kindergarten. That probably explains it. That's true. Did you oh, go to kindergarten? or uh, I did. Or I did. Oh, yeah. I went to kindergarten, but I didn't go to, uh, what, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Wow. No. Uh, did you, th- you skip them? Well, so I had, um, I had a very serious upbringing. My dad was trying to catch up for all the things he hadn't gotten around to in his childhood. So I had kind of wall-to-wall education um, uh, lessons in everything. My dad had three Steinways in the home, and he wanted us, because we have, there were four boys, competitive family, and we all had to practice for an hour a day. It was ruthless. And so at about 14, somehow I convinced my dad, who was an interesting mix of serious and playful, um, to send me off to a kind of school they don't make anymore. It was named after a school in England called Summerhill. And this was a school where classes were not compulsory. And so I just didn't attend classes for seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Um, and then I popped into public school right afterwards and did just fine. I did just fine. So, <laughs> so now when I now when I list my name, I describe myself as Jeremy Sherman, PhD, MPP, GED, because there was it's almost like I didn't have any education. <laughs> it is kind of an interesting story to go from GED to, to PhD, but we'll get into that because I wanted to uh, mention first off the bat that you have a fun podcast. Would you like to to share the name of your podcast? I have three podcasts actually. One is called Negotiate with Yourself and Win which is debates between me and myself um, about I- important, interesting subjects. Another one is called To Name It Is To Tame It, uh, terms for reading between the lines with greater comprehension. These are word of the day. I've ended up making up about 1,500 uh, wow. words for, for, for moves you see in everyday life that don't have names. Um, but it really does benefit us to have them. Do you and have an example? Other, what's that? What's your favorite example? Oh, let me see. Uh, um, oh, shoot. I mean, okay, here's, here's one, insistent replay. So you're, someone's monologuing at you, and uh, they don't want any interruptions or challenges. And if you challenge them, even just if you ask for a question of clarification, they start over from the beginning. Because their assumption is that the only way you could possibly challenge them is if you didn't understand, didn't hear the thing. So they tell it over. That's insistent replay. And I come up with one of those about every day and then I put them out on as, as a podcast. But the third one, probably the one you were referring yes. to, is what's up with assholes? Um, advanced psychoproctology for beginners. And it's basically how I did my last edits on my book. I read the entire thing in. It's a pod class. For if you happen oh. to be one of the rare humans who was ever dealt with someone you experience as an a-hole, um, 
and uh, and were frustrated by it and think that something ought to be done about such people. This is basically a book and a podcast on the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of assholery. Core question is, what is a butthead since it can't just be whomever you happen to butt heads with? And how do you stop them without becoming one? Well, that's what I want to dive into, too. So we got a lot to unpack here today on the podcast because my, I have two initial opening questions on this. Number one is, um, yes, I feel like everybody, uh, like on the highway, right? Anybody that drives faster than you is a maniac. Anybody that drives slower than you is exactly. a moron. Exactly. That's right. Right? Uh, <laughs> so I love that one. Uh, and I feel like the definition of, of what's an a-hole and why people are a-holes will be very interesting to me because normally we talk about playful humans and what makes a playful human, why it's important to do that. But I think it's a, a, an important discussion to explore the dark side of this, right? Like like Star Wars, if we have the light and what we're trying to do is be playful, nurturing, fun, healthy human beings, why do some people end up on the dark side? So what, yeah, what is your answer? What is up with assholes? Um, well, one interesting uh, segue into that is this distinction between hypocrites and ironists, because both of them are equivocators. Both of them talk out both sides of their mouth. So what's the difference? Um, and you can say one of the big differences is that hypocrites are humorless. Um, <laughs> they're, they're only consistent in one thing, which is their declaration that they're consistent. They're not actually consistent at all, um, but they take themselves very seriously they engage in a whole lot of shameless shaming. Um, so they, they will play the, the, uh, the, the condescending parent to you, telling you how to live. Um, uh, and, and I can see why. I mean, uh, outrage, whenever I feel outrage at someone for, let's say, doing something that bothered me, immediately will vaporize from all of my recollection anything I've ever done that's the equivalent. That is, outrage feels like a total <laughs> purging. So sure. um, it kind of girds your loin for holy war. And holy war is an oxymoron. Oxymorons are, uh, are the heart of irony. But um, So nothing's cleaner than holiness and nothing's dirtier than war. So you end up with these people who, who act like no deed is too dirty for saints like them. Um, but ironists are different. Ironists, they know they're talking out both sides of their mouth. They, they recognize that life is complicated and that they need to be serious and they need to be playful. And they put that on the table. They kind of demonstrate it and indicate it. It's kind of a mating call to fellow ironists. Um, mm -hmm. That we're all trying to we're all trying to figure it out. It's not easy to figure it out, and so uh, yeah, a lot of what drives my work is that kind of ironic awareness. My some of my early earliest mantras were: uh, I wouldn't put it past me uh, to do the shit that people do, and another one was: uh, No matter how hard I chase the truth, it will never catch me. Um, <laughs> my dad was funny. He was an ironist. Uh, he, uh, um, he would say things like, I haven't lived my life in vain for nothing. Um, so <laughs> all of that's, all of that's ironic humor. And I think it's the right response to reality because the thing about reality is that the bedrock pulls the rug out from under itself pretty often. Um, that is, there is something fundamentally slapstick about nature. And I actually could describe that. I won't here, mind you, but I could describe that in physical chemical terms. I work on origins of life research. I have a sense of how the paradoxes are actually uh, intrinsic. They're built well, into that's this. That's something uh, I don't know if I just, uh, you know, visited California one too many times in, in uh, the pandemic or... Uh, or what, but I have come to find it, and that's how I got to this play work, is that I don't know that there's that many like absolutes, that many things that aren't ironic when it comes down to it, right? Any strength to an extreme is a weakness, yeah. uh, and like any weakness can be a strength. Yeah, I mean, it's just- Yeah, you go off one of the, the spectrum, you end up on the other. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so- uh, so for me, I, I love all of that. I think it's really interesting. I did have one to ask you, which is, do you think Alanis Morissette knew that nothing in her song was ironic? Uh, when if she, she wrote did, it? it would be ironic. It would be ironic if she knew that and didn't say, and um, no, people are really unclear on the term irony. <laughs> um, uh, there are 
lots of definitions, many of them bordering on hypocrisy. So one of the things you can do, um, try this out. It, it, suppose someone called you a name caller. Um, you could have two responses to that. One would be, ha ha, you just called me a name caller, which is name calling. Therefore, I don't have to listen to you. So that's an invitation into what I'd call cynical hypocrisy. Um, it basically licensed to do whatever because nothing means anything. My approach, the ironic approach, is to say, oh, that's interesting. There's a paradox there. Don't be a name caller yeah. is a paradox. Or um, uh, So are most of our moral um, declarations. You shouldn't be judgmental is judgmental. Do not be negative is negative. Be intolerant of intolerance is intolerant. Commit yourself to flexibility is a commitment. Every one of them, I can, the golden <laughs> rule itself is yeah. a paradox. And so once you see that, I think you're actually, if you go the ironic route, you're transported into that quest for the wisdom to know the differences that make a difference, like when to be a name caller, when to be intolerant. So I'll often say to people, look, I don't want to just name call. I want to name call with surgical precision. I want to name call when <laughs> it's right to name call. I don't want to name call when it's wrong to. And I will spend my life trying to guess when is right and when is wrong. That's the ironic stance. So I love this. And I love that we can get super deep with you. I do want to circle back to a-holes at some point. But nice belt. I took this to the extreme life itself that way, though, and the way that it's set up is very much that, that we have no idea what's next. And some people find that religion and some sort of certainty about what is after death gives them peace or gives their life yeah, meaning. Yeah. But I actually kind of believe currently that if there is no purpose after life, that would actually give more meaning because of what we're talking about to what's happening now, right? That if you believe that there's yeah, some sort of eternity that means what now is is temporary but if you believe there's not anything later what's now is the only thing that matters so that's everything it would make it more meaningful yeah, to live well right yes uh, to me it's double-edged so i made a t-shirt a while ago live each lifetime as if it's your last um found <laughs> it, it's designed right. to be paradoxical and yeah. it actually cuts both light ways if it is your last then you could go to the Rudolph Giuliani route. He was asked recently uh, whether he was concerned about his legacy. He said, no, nah, I'll be dead, is what he said. So, yeah. which, well, um, which is one of the problems with, uh, what, what do we have? We have an octogenary, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a government by 80-year-olds. It's a little bit of a problem yes. because these guys are going to be gone soon and, and, they're, and they're leaving the party uh, for you guys to clean up, you youngsters. Um, hmm. But at the same time, it does suggest that you should make the most of your time here. So I actually am interested in the way that it cuts both ways. And I even made up a paradox about this. So if you're only going to live for one day like an aphid, you don't need to face reality. It's not an issue. You can, in which case, you can believe in reincarnation because you don't have to be realistic. But if you're going to believe in reincarnation, then you're going to live a long time which means you're going to live many times, which means you have to be realistic, which means you can't believe in real in reincarnation. <laughs> I know. Yeah, well, I think that's kind of what's so interesting about it. So I'm very much agnostic that, that I just don't know. I didn't want it to sound like I am atheist because I, I feel like agnostic is the only way that is possible because if you know for certain that you don't know, then you, <laughs> you know, and like it's, it's a paradox, right? And, and, uh, yes. Except let me, let me uh, suggest something around that because we don't know any. So I am what we call a fallibilist. A fallibilist is, mm -hmm. this is a fundamental concept in uh, epistemology, which is a branch of philosophy, basically how you shop among interpretations. And a fallibilist believes that you can't reach a hundred percent about anything. You can't be a hundred percent certain about anything. So my motto as a fallibilist is, no matter how confident I am in a bet, I'm still more confident that it is a bet. But there is a move that people sometimes make, which is because we can't make, uh, we can't know anything for certain, all bets are equally good. And I don't go there. I call that the doctrine of foregone inconclusion. And I actually <laughs> think it's a cheater's move because mostly it's used by people who say, uh, don't touch my beliefs. You can't, you can't touch my beliefs because you don't know for certain what you believe. No, obviously some bets are better than others. And anybody who says 
that all bets are equal is basically saying my bet is better than yours, that all bets are equal, which doesn't. So, you know, every time I find a paradox, I laugh and I and I dig a little deeper. Anyway, I am not an agnostic. Um, I do recognize that I can't know anything for certain. Um, I also know that uh, anybody who claims to be an agnostic or even a religious person is placing bets about what's more likely than other things. Uh, so, for example, I oppose this to, to friends who've declared themselves agnostic. I say, sure, uh, anything's possible. But the chance that your soul at death migrates into a gummy worm in a Polynesian 7-Eleven, I think you probably say is decimal dust likely, really unlikely. So right. um, now I happen to work on the origins of effort in the universe. That's my. That's a lot of my work. Half of my work is on that. I have a book out with Columbia University Press we, uh, in which I, uh, I deprived myself of almost all humor. I was trying to be serious. But it's a, but um, so for me, I mean, I look at the universe, uh, best guess these days, it's about 14 billion years old. First 10 billion years, we don't see anything that can't be explained by physical chemistry. That is, we don't see any trying for 10 billion years. And then in the last 4 billion years, we've got organisms trying. Now, I'm not talking about feeling like trying or knowing they're trying or any of that. I'm just saying that a bacterium is trying to stay alive. It's struggling for its existence. So if that's the case, I'm the kind of guy who says no mattering that is trying to do what matters is uh, is something that emerged from nothing but chemistry, and that's where that research is. I'm what I call myself an apophatic ap uh, an apathetic apophatic. Uh, apathetic means uh, I'm, I don't think the gods are relevant if they exist at all. And apophatic is actually a whole branch of theology that says you can't say anything positive about God's nature. You can only say what God isn't. And so as an apath hmm. apath apathetic, I don't care whether it's a God. I don't, think it's, I don't think it has any bearing. It's like saying there's a wild card in the universe that trumps all else. Yeah, but if you can't tell me what the wild card contains, then what bearing does it have on anything we do? In this, I'm actually with a guy named Lucretius way back when. He was the first kind mm -hmm. of... Uh, a uh, guy who's made that point. Um, but an apophatic, by apophatic, I mean, whatever you say about God's nature, nah, I don't buy it. I think, I don't, I don't, I don't bet we can say much about it. In the meantime, though, one last thing here. Um, I do think we need religion. I think we need, not religion, but we need escapism. I think escapism is inescapable. Life is really weird mm. for humans. And so I, a lot of my work is on what I call optimal illusion, how to kid ourselves in ways that help and don't harm. So wow. I'm all for people joining all sorts of clubs in which they revel, they self-pleasure in their exceptionality, but you got to do it with a return ticket to reality in your hard pocket because you got to come back. So you know, I don't, I'm not religious at all. I've made up for religions, um, but I, but don't get me wrong. I'm as delusional as the next guy. I've got to be, life is, a, life, life is, life is difficult. So, <laughs> well, that's where I, I would think my follow-up question was for yeah. you, because you mentioned the struggle. And I think that is very much true that somehow life has always been a struggle since it existed on this planet. Yeah. It's a um, double struggle for us. Way yeah, and then and we're because we're aware of it, uh, which makes it, I think, a thousand times harder or <laughs> right. infinitely more harder. Uh, but I think also there is this weird thing that like all animals play and that we're we're totally. somehow tuned to enjoy it along the way, which to me seems contradictory or at least ironic in the fact that none of us are going to make it out alive. But living is is the part that makes it interesting. Yeah. So uh, I, where I focus on this question of why life is especially hard for humans is because we have language. So we're the only creature, we, technically we're a symbolic species. We're the only ones who can basically have a whole other world in our minds. Language isn't just for communicating, it's how we think. So if you compare what a dog could worry about before going to bed to what you could worry about, real and imagined, um, 
it, it's overwhelming what humans deal with. We would be an anxious species. I think of us as trudging through a sandstorm of mojo eroding possibilities. Not just all the threats real and imagined, but all the FOMO, all the missed opportunities, all that stuff. So we would be stress bunnies, as as would be any intelligent life form anywhere in the mm. universe. If you define intelligence as having this symbolic capacity, basically a whole worldview you make up in your in your mind. But language also affords us lots of ways to escape the threatening feeling. That's another place where religion comes in is that you can imagine that you've got this imaginary friend who's on your side and has your back and all that sort of stuff. So uh, you could do it that way. You can do it any number of ways. It doesn't take religion to do it. You can do it politically. You can do it uh, philosophically, yeah, whatever. You join a club and you feel like somehow you found some freedom and safety that, that you deserve because you found it and well, you know whatever. So, so there's all that. In the meantime, this, there's this business about play. So one of the things we humans can do is we can live in the virtual world, um, the first virtual world being our minds, I, that is you can go off in your imagination. But by now we have all of these virtual worlds in which we can get our yayas out um, mm. uh, any number of ways. Uh, so a big question for me, uh, tongue twisters, tongue twisters, it's a pair of questions, is virtual virtue a virtue or a vice? Mm -hmm. Virtual virtue is like imagining that you're heroic and that you just saved a bunch of people. Is that good for you or bad for you? Or good for us or bad for us? And likewise, is virtual vice a virtue or a vice? Um, we can do all that stuff through play. Uh, that is, virtual virtue is part of what we do when we're playing. We play heroes. You know, kids will play Superman or whatever. Um, right. Or they can play uh, the villain, the nasty villain. Um, it's interesting to me that we want opposite responses to virtual virtue and virtual vice. We want virtual virtue to motivate real virtue. We don't want people going to see a movie thinking they're heroic and then walking out and telling the homeless person to, 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 to go away because I already gave in the theater. You know, I am already was heroic. You don't want that. You want them to actually be motivated to do virtuous things. And yet we want the opposite effect from virtual vice. We want you to have, to, to drain the lizard offline, basically, you know? Yeah. Uh, do you do you feel like one is more likely than the other that it is more likely that imagining has no effect or that it has some lasting effect? well it's a huge question and uh the short answer is i think that um human a uh, humankind hangs in the balance of whether we get good at distinguishing fiction from fact uh from reality from fiction and mm -hmm. there are lots of motivations for not doing so but I actually bet, I mean, mm. if you look around the universe uh, and you speculate from the perspective I bring, this natural history perspective, I'm guessing that a whole lot of language species, that is intelligent life forms in the universe, have flamed out from not being able to make the distinction. We're bimundial. We live in two worlds. I'm a legend in my own mind, and I still have to live in reality. And how I balance those, how I deal with them is really an interesting challenge. Yeah, so let me ask you, because this is where uh, I'm at currently on this one. Uh, we have the law of attraction, right, that tells you, like, what you believe can kind of manifest in your universe. And we're seeing that a lot now, especially online and in our virtual worlds, right, that the algorithm will show you what you want. If you want to see puppies, it will show you all the puppies we can keep puppies we can find in the world. If you want to see murder and mayhem, we can show you all the murder and mayhem you can handle, right? And so the, in a way our beliefs can shape reality more than reality can shape our beliefs, in my opinion. It, that, it, okay. that we can be delusional to the point that reality doesn't matter other than some core physics principles like we can't fly or we can die or we, we need food and water, right? Um, my my take on that is different, and I did I hmm. did spend some time on the uh, law of attraction, not as a uh, not as a uh, adherent to it. I I was mostly studying it as a movement that shows up. I think of it as showing up like every uh, seventeen years, like locusts. Um, uh, I actually I I don't buy it. I think we're somnipotent. I don't think we're omnipotent. I don't <laughs> think my beliefs can actually influence everything. I I'm trying to figure out what I can change and what I can't change. 
Um, right. And um, and and I did notice an interesting loophole, at least in the presentations of the law of attraction I saw, which was that the universe doesn't understand the word no. So if I say I want to end genocide, it's going to bring me more genocide, um, which right. is a great loophole for them because they can, they can say uh, I could come to them and complain. I can say, hey, um, I was trying to manifest having a girlfriend and she never showed up. And they say, yeah, but did you not want to have not ha did you not want to be alone? And I tell you, well, yeah, I mean, it's obvious because it's relative. Every preference is relative. If I want more of this, I don't want more of that. And they say, ah, well, so you said you'd, you didn't want to be alone. So the universe gave you loneliness. So once you got a loophole like that in a theory, um, it can be a comfort. It can be a motivator. I know people who've really benefited from the law of attraction. Um, is it realistic? No, I don't think so. Um, the idea that I can manifest uh, whatever reality I think has led to a whole lot of the danger. I would actually say that that belief is this failure to distinguish fiction from reality. And um, it could easily to lead to uh, the extermination of the species, the, uh, the extinction of us um, to th yeah. for people to, to peep for people to act like that. I mean, to give you an example, I don't think that Donald Trump is a wise man. I'm sorry if 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 anybody disagrees. No, I I mean he's he's part of the motivation for my book. I think he is as pure and pristine an example of an a-hole as you can get because <laughs> you can't even tell what he believes. He does I mean you could mistake Stalin for a communist or you could mistake Hitler for a nationalist or an anti-semite. No, they were assholes. And I think Trump Trump is a cleaner version of that. He is all about the law of attraction. And you right. say, okay, well, you, 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 you can use it for good causes. I use it for good causes. Yeah, that's what they all say. You know, he thinks he's using it for a good cause. So, no, I'm not a fan of it. I, I'm trying to figure out how to use my somnipotence, my power to change some things. And I do know that my attitude matters a lot, but it matters right. when it's harnessed to my behavior. The attitude alone is not. That would be the that would be the the cheap version. It's basically saying all of reality is virtual and you get to change the channel to whatever you want. Sure, I'd like that kind of power, but I wouldn't want my brother to have that kind of power because it's so anyway. Well, I I love that because I think what what you're saying is, is true. What do we have the power to control and not control is the key and getting yeah. that question right. Uh, yeah. So some things your attitude matters more than others right like if you sure. believe you can walk through a wall you're going to find out that, that you yeah, can't that's right. that's right right but yeah. if you believe that you're in love that might be enough uh, uh to, no in love. in all these cases um it might might is the important word i mean so one way to say one way to dis, 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 distill the law of attraction is fake it till you make it that is assume that something that you're destined to get something until you get it but I do think of fake it till you make it as paired with face it till you make it. So mm. face it till you make it means, no, I have to really face into the fact that I'm not making it in order to improve my chances of making it. And in a way, that's the heart of science. Science is basically saying to get what you want, set aside what you want long enough to see what is. And then better informed, you'll be in a better position to get what you want. That's very different from fake it till you make it. So I'm all for both. I'm just trying to figure out when to face it and when to fake it, right? That's really good. I, I like that. I like face it till you make it because I think that's uh, a lot of the, it, it addresses all the fears and ours not wanting to take the action and like wait to win the lottery rather than to face our, our fears or face the reality that's in, in front of us. Right. We're, yeah. we're playing, hoping. So uh, I want to ask you one more on this one. And then sure, I feel sure. like we should end on, on something fun here. And no, I, I completely agree. This is entirely too serious. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, okay. So, uh, but it's very fun conversation for Good. me. Here's my last one. We seem to believe that we can control almost everything that we can go and colonize Mars and we can control all the microbes and chemical balance of our systems and that we can design nanobots that can sync with satellites and all. And from what I've seen is we are not anywhere close to what the ideas we've come up with. So I, I guess that's what you're saying about societies flaming out, right? Is that we start 
burning fossil fuels and trying to send billionaires to space before we start worrying about global warming, those things don't balance and we don't catch up, our advancements don't catch up with what our, our beliefs or our imagination has. It, it, did yeah. I get that right? Or how do you think yeah, about no, you, you, like you're, what we You're onto control? something important. And um, uh, here's a connection there. A buddy of mine is a biological anthropologist of some note. And someone said, so uh, has humankind had its uh, day in the sun? I mean, is our best behind us? And he says, actually, if you really want to look for our day in the sun, it was Homo ergaster, which lasted for about 2 million years and didn't develop any new tools. Now that's sustainability. Um, he said every, there were weather disruptions. They started developing tools. The tools complicated and changed the world that they were living in. So they had to develop more tools. The way I pictured this, uh, was mm -hmm. imagine you're standing on top of a very tall, unstable pile of sand and uh, someone something knocks the pile of sand and it starts to move. So you start to shift to adjust so that you can regain your balance on the sand. And as you shift and adjust, the sand starts falling faster. You could describe us now as dancing at flailing high speed, coming up with innovation after innovation and thinking yeah. of it as progress as the sand uh, grounds down to the ground. We, we have expectations of our, uh, we, we expect our expectations to be met more than any other humans in human history. We keep on tooling up. I'm a, I just turned 65. Um, I love the way they're just rolling out the red carpet for me. The second my foot's got to step on it, you know, I needed hearing aids and suddenly they came out with the just killer hearing aids, wonderful mm -hmm. hearing aids. Um, I, I've been lucky so far, uh, but it is it is a time when our we expect more and assume we will pay less, and I I worry for future generations because I don't think that's sustainable. One of the places right. where it's hardest is this: I love hanging out on my computer because I get to control everything on it. I mean that thing is my total slave. People are harder than that. So if you if you come away from your comp computer, I call it robo envy expecting or hoping that people will behave like computers. And, right. if, and if someone's annoying me, I can just reprogram them. Not going to happen. People are way messier than computers. We are not computers. Uh, but there's a part of us that would wish we were like that. And there's plenty of things that are being advertised to us as if we are. Just take this new bioflora and you'll be perfect. You know, take this new religion or believe this new mantra or whatever, or buy this new tool. Um, it would make us uh, quick fix jump junkies. And I do believe in quick fixes, just not as many as are on offer. <laughs> yes. And so I, I lied. I have one more down. Oh, question man, for it's you. all good. And, and then we're going to transition back. But I heard this great line one time, and I, I wish I remember who said it, but they said, if corporations were people, they would be assholes. Um, yes. And I'm wondering how you feel about that with your work with, with assholes and your thought about humankind and technology is I, I feel like everybody making these promises or, or going for profits or looking for some version of material or technological success are missing the point of play and enjoyment. And they're just being assholes trying to collect more resources. Well, uh, yeah. So um, I did coin the term CEO path for a psychopath <laughs> CEO. I think that was the term, I can't remember, but it was something like that. No, they are, they actually would be, uh, they would be psychopaths. As, as humans, if they were humans, they would be psychopaths um, because they don't have a nervous system. Uh, that is, they can be hurt on the bottom line, but the bottom line is not tied to reality the way you might hope it would be. Um, and, uh, and in a way they're all about play those guys it's it's pure hedonics at the top that is mm -hmm. the goal is to make so much money you could do anything you want the problem with some of these guys is they don't know what they want to do so they i mean it's incredible how trite they tend to be the image of uh, yachts and champagnes and swimming pools and bikinis i mean not very creative. I mean, if you're going to play, I, I at least I can give hats off to going to space. I don't think it's the top priority, but at least it's a <laughs> little bit more creative than just buying another car. Um, but I'll give them that because I completely agree with you. I think when I look at people like athletes and, and other celebrities that get hundreds of millions of dollars, 
they really end up for like more rooms in their house, more cars in their garage, yeah. more boats that they can ride on or never read. But they, yeah. it's never anything interesting or creative. No, it's, it's nothing that I don't have access to. No, it's totally boring. And not only that, I, I've lived in big houses, more places to lose your keys. I don't, I'm not a fan. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Right. No, I like a small space. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. So finding something more useful to do, but the, but it, it is a problem. And yet I want to suggest that in a way, these people are highly evolved. If you look at what's going on in nature, mm. no one's got foresight. No one's got empathy. That's a human thing. It comes with language. If you look at animals, it's me and my lineage um, uh, at whatever expense, even to the long-term, uh, even long-term consequences for their own kind. Um, so that's one of the paradoxes. What we, what we mean by highly evolved can mean just beastly. Um, you know, these guys are super duper predators because they've got language to rationalize their predatorship. Um, yeah. At the same time, uh, we like to redefine evolution in a way that, that makes it so we don't go extinct. That'd be good. <laughs> All right. So I need you to put me and everybody else back together and tell us where you landed on this, how you still decide that like, humor and play and being a part of this world is is fun and interesting because you seem like a very optimistic and playful person despite all of the craziness and struggles that we've talked about here yeah it's a it's a good question i i i think i think there are two two parts of it one more personal one more philosophical one was i i've had a weird life i i inherited money at a young age which made me uncharacteristically anxious i didn't feel like partying um, I felt weird about it. I felt guilty um, and even signed a vow of poverty and joined the world's largest hippie commune at four, at 20 years old and felt great peace of mind from joining this wonderful, it was more like a boot camp than like an orgy. It was great. It was great for me. It um, really mm -hmm. grew me up in a lot of ways, even though it was kind of naive in its own way. But um, uh, But there was something that happened to me around maybe around 50. I'm 65 now. But I suddenly realized that I no longer needed status, that status is something you need if you need to put food on your table. But a lot of people end up trying to accumulate status for other reasons, too. And I had been kind of obsessed with gaining it, and I wasn't gaining it. So I kind of relaxed into the courage of my insignificance. That is, it turns out I'm not going to save the world. Um, I'm not even gonna make a dent, kind of disappointing. I was hoping for a little more power than that, but I didn't get it. Um, uh, in part because the things that interested me, uh, were a little off the beaten track. They shouldn't be, I don't think. I mean, I'm on, I'm on some of the most fundamental questions in the universe and yet people don't get around to them in part because they're busy hustling to make it through their day. So my stuff doesn't sell that well. Um, and it, I don't need it to, it turned out. And that, re that relieved me a lot. Um, well, I love that. Can I speak to that? And then we'll sure, talk about no, the philosophical part, because that speaks to me. And I think where I'm getting to, even with playful humans here is it's a fairly new venture for me. And I have another podcast about sales and sales training and leadership, and it's got over 2 million downloads and, uh, you know, oh, people, dig, and of course, everybody wants to, to learn how to make money and, and stuff. And I think all that's great, but the, I think measuring yourself, we, we see these unrealistic standards now where like maybe in the fifties, we could be the Brady bunch. We could have an architect job and be happy yeah. and have fun with the family. But now the Kardashians are the most famous family on television and we can't get that. And we feel like that significance is out of reach. And I think that's what is causing everybody stress when you come to grips with yeah, I'm not that important. I'm not the, the world doesn't revolve around me. Making an impact for 10, a hundred, a thousand people in my local community is good enough. I don't need to be a million followers on TikTok in order to feel like I made yeah. a difference. I think that's what gives you your power back. Yeah. Courage of your own insignificance is actually the, it, my dad coined that term and I, and it stuck with me. I liked it. Um, yeah. So that, that has been a freedom for me. Um, I happen to be next door neighbors. This is Berkeley. I'm half, I'm ne next door neighbors half the year with this year's Nobel prize winner in literature. Um, <laughs> and she's interesting this way because she didn't want to do any interviews when she won the Nobel and she had won all the other damn awards before she's a poet. Um, 
and very insular in her in her stylings. So it's interesting. I got no status. She's got lots of status. We get together for lunch every uh, for dinner every every week when we're out here. Um, and uh, it's nice to have followers, but they are kind of labor intensive. You end up having to spend a lot of time courting them, and then when you've courted them and succeeded in gaining them, you have to sustain them. Um, and I didn't. I actually didn't want that in the end. Um, uh, mm. You know, I just noticed now there's a parallel. I've been single, very happily married to solitude for the last five years. I just got back into a relationship, but it feels radically different from all the ones before, uh, which were full of drama and uh, and and the romance, uh, the pluses and minuses of romance. But I've been saying for these last five years that I'm glad my lack of appetite finally caught up with my lack of aptitude. I'm not really that good at close range. I'm too mouthy. I'm too noisy. I'm not good at biting my tongue. I wouldn't want to be with me if I was someone else. I'd, I'd drive them crazy. I think the same thing, and it just occurs to me now, I think the same thing has happened to me in my research and writing. I would not want to do all the hoop jumping I'd need to in order to, to cultivate that. I don't need it anymore. The Kardashian lifestyle looks exhausting and uh, trivial actually, in comparison to yeah. what's interesting to me. What's interesting to me is conversations like this. It's like you're sitting on the front porch of the universe, speculating about it and us in it. That's my idea of a good time. I'll do that until I die. Um, and I'll take notes. That's all I do. Take notes. And was there one more philosophical answer we didn't get well, to? No, or no, did the philosophical answer is, it was about irony. And in a way, I already mm -hmm. touched on it uh, already. But check this out as a simple example. Um, We've got to explain how organisms come into being. Organisms are the things that try. Machines don't try, you know, uh, uh, chemicals don't try, but organisms do, and they do from the start. Well, the interesting thing about us is that we have to take in energy um, in order to keep hustling. Uh, and mm -hmm. we hustle in all sorts of ways we don't even account for. We think of ourselves as our thinking and our feeling. Nonsense. On my slouchiest day, I had a kind of lame day yesterday. I'd just gotten back from Portland. I still managed to generate 240 billion new cells yesterday. I'm a badass, <laughs> but I don't even know it. It's going on on the inside. Um, but anyway, for that, I've got to take in energy. And energy is exactly what degenerates us. That is, that's why they put uh, uh, electricity running through very inert plastic insulation that's why pipes have to be durable energy is exactly what degenerates us so the core irony of being alive is that we are using energy against itself we are using energy to protect ourselves from energy um now that i'd have to detail that and i won't do it here but it's it's an interesting story but it shows you just how paradoxical we are from the from the from the beginning uh yeah from, yeah and so well, we're growing and, and dying at the same time is what I hear you say from the that's very right. moment no, we're born, right? Yeah, as long as as long as we're alive, we are working to regenerate at a pace that out that outpaces degeneration. And in the end, we lose that game. Um, so you know, it, it, I haven't lived my life in vain for nothing, or um uh I've wasted my whole lear life learning things I now already know. That kind of stuff. Those ironies are just, they tickle me. And they're and I and I find their roots in the natural sciences. Man, we might have to do a, a part two because I feel like we've already gone uh far too long. But um that's interesting because we do see things like play in nature where it seems yeah. to be an investment or uh dispelling energy yeah. that would be counterintuitive to to what we're talking about or evolution that running or, or playing around or play fighting uh you're learning some skills but you you're not necessarily Beautiful. conserving energy in a way no you're not conserving energy uh and uh so there's a lot of work on this um uh gregory bateson did important work on how uh mm. how dogs signal irony because they they to practice fighting it needs to feel serious. It's like any video game. Something's got to feel serious, but not be serious. So how they send a mixed message uh, by snarling while wagging their tails, that's pure irony at the animal level, mm -hmm. pre-linguistic. Pre and then one of my, I just recently read a fabulous book. I had read it once before, but I had to read it again by a guy named Arthur Kessler. Uh, 
uh, the act of creation. And in it, he works through how play is essential. He starts with humor, then moves to science, then moves to the arts. And this is this guy was a he was mind blow, blowing. It's a it's a dense book, but he writes it twice. So the first book is accessible, and then he writes a more technical version. They're they're bound together. But anyway, no, I assume that play is central to everything. Now I live in California, and I'm a hippie, which means I get stoned most nights. Um, and uh, and and I don't need to to think like this anymore. I've been a stoner for so long that um, I think like this anyway. But I do think of it as an opportunity for kind of cross fertilization in the mind. Um, and I often yield interesting, rigorous ideas out of it. Some of my best ideas have come from a kind of relaxing or melting down of the boundaries. And that's a core assumption about one of the things we humans are doing with play is that we get what he calls by associations. You get contradictions and the contradictions are kind of the heart of what you get in jokes. So, and what makes it interesting for us, right? If there was a a one right answer, we go, okay, got it, and we move on. No, that's uh, right. So, so when jokes we create these contradictions. Exactly, that makes it fun for us. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, so on that note, let me tell you a joke. I didn't tell you I was going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's Saturday afternoon. The guy's out in the yard mowing the lawn, and his wife's up in the bedroom, and she says, "Darling, will you come upstairs?" And he goes upstairs. She says, will you take off my blouse? He takes off her blouse. Will you take off my skirt? He takes off her skirt. Will you take off my bra? He takes off her bra. She says, I don't want to ever see you wearing my clothes again. <laughs> so that's an example of the kind of you're heading towards one uh, interpretation and it points out that there's another one. You, you snap into another one. That's an example. Can I tell you my, my favorite one like I that? I want to hear it. Yes, uh, it's a great comedian, and his uh, his name escapes me at the moment. Maybe I'll remember it by the time we're done. But um, he said, I went to uh, college at the University of Missouri. That's where I went. I finished there in two years. A lot of people find that impressive. A lot of those people have degrees. <laughs> <laughs> I love there's, it. I love it. There's no fences or walls or anything. You want to be done after two years, you just be done. That's right. Um, and I love that uh, because it works on, on so many good. levels. Uh, and then uh, I did go back and finish my degree, by the way. But uh, but I thought it was uh, good. You do that. <laughs> such a great uh, such a great story. So um, last thing here today, would you like to play a game? Yes, sure. All right, we're spinning our wheel of games. There are ten games on there. It could land on, and you got the whisper challenge. The whisper challenge is pretty easy. All we have to do is put ourselves on mute. It's a ton of fun for the podcast listeners, and then we say a phrase. And the other person tries to read their lips and guess what we said. A lot of people have practice listening to people on mute here for the last year. So uh, would you like to go first or would you like me to go first? I'll go first. Okay. So just mute and, and give me uh, your one sentence. I love you. I had the great honor of dating a, uh, a model for a while. And um, uh, my friend said, oh, wow, a blonde, a blind model. How lucky are you, Jeremy? Because I wasn't, I wasn't in her league. But she told me that in high school, she used to tease the boys by whispering olive juice at them. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. mean, so mean. Oh, oh you oh, are mean. So I No, I meant, zero. I meant what you said, what you said. But I did, you know, you Yes, I didn't really mean olive juice, okay? <laughs> uh, okay, I got one for you. Here we go. Oh, good Lord. Oh, man. That was one of my dad's favorite quotes. You, you, uh, okay, you're going to have to do it again. Was it, you, you said it one time, right? Yeah. The, the wow, two sentences long. Here. Okay, let me see if I can do it. assholes everybody's got one. Oh yes uh you got the end of it so you win you got at least uh four words there uh opinions are like assholes, assholes everybody right, has one got, exactly. uh, opinions was the first part yeah exactly uh Nicely that was done. one of my dad's favorite uh favorite yes. Quotes. <laughs> yes and yet some opinions are better than others <laughs> awesome well thank you for playing for winning you get a free 30 second commercial here anything you want to ask or give to the audience uh 
the, um, the stage is yours. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, um, check out my website, which I'm building right now, jeremysherman.com. Check out my podcasts. Uh, you get my book for free if you email me, actually. You get my, my, I'll send you my PDF of my book. Um, or you can just go listen to it, uh, What's Up With A-Holes, uh, Advanced Psychoproctology for Beginners, or either of my two other podcasts, To Name It Is To Tame It, or Negotiate With Yourself and Win. I love it. I already subscribed to your podcast. I can't wait to, to hear the What's Up With Assholes uh, or a-holes, uh, if we want to be clean. And now that we've said it 400 times on the podcast. So I really uh, appreciate it, Jeremy. It was a ton of fun today and, uh, really an enlightening discussion and talking about really what's the best way to live, which is what playful humans is all about. Uh, because I kind of landed on, uh, enjoying it. If you got to live, you might as well enjoy it. And that's what playful humans is and rediscovering the power of play for adults. So at one point you had genius levels of creativity and a ton of fun. What happened to it? That's what we discuss in the Playful Humans Club. Go check it out at playfulhumans.com. Have a great day, everybody. Don't wait for tomorrow. Live for today. Keep on chasing the sunshine. And go out and play. Go play, everybody.